Uh, this is part two of the American Gulag, only this one here, as on the handout here, is the Gulag itself. And perhaps the place to start is with the quote. This quote I found interesting. I was, you know, going through, I, I, knew, this, I knew this quote existed. I just had to go back over my Jefferson library and find it, and I did. Uh, I this is Jefferson. I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only that blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance, don't you love the way they used to word things back in the day? Yeah. Are inferior to whites in the endowments both of body and mind. This, this apparently, too bad, he's not a, too bad he's not around today to see the professional basketball and football. This unfortunate difference of color or perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people. That's Thomas Jefferson. And I found this in, for those of you looking, for, well, it's, it's on the handout, but for those of you looking for a reference here, it's actually in on page 270, his notes of the state of Virginia. It's Thomas Jefferson's writings. You can find this in you know, other books of Thomas Jefferson's writings, but it's within the notes for the state of Virginia. Uh, interesting. So right from the get-go, one of your founders, of course, that could be said by some of your other founders too, consider blacks really not people, property, an item to be owned, whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and so why? Well, this has been inculcated in Americans, hasn't it? It still exists to this day that blacks are not, are not the equivalent of whites. Happens. That's what seems to be. In fact, I was reading uh, one of these... Uh, one, one, I've, been, I've been getting, trying to get into some of these groups that feel emboldened now since November 2016. Groups like Daily Stormer, Otto Waffen, uh, Vanguard for America, you know, groups to the extreme right. And in the Daily Stormer, Andrew Anglin is one of those who says National Football League, it's the Negro Football League. Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, he was one of, in fact, you can go on the Daily Stormer site, type in Daily Stormer Connecticut, and you can find some of their recent pronouncements relating to Connecticut news and how they interpret it. And there was a murder of a 44-year-old woman up in Hartford. The accused was a black man. And the headline on Daily Stormer, you know, arrested, no. Ape rested. Oh, yeah. This is public. And not, not, uh, not connected to the murder of this, the, murder, the death of this lady. Guess how they spelled it? Coon necked Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they feel emboldened after November 2016 because you know who got into the Oval Office. And they say this. In fact, Andrew Anglin states. Glorious leader, God Emperor. And he supported the current occupant since, no, since 17 months before the election, he states. So this is where some of your politics has gravitated toward as of late. And so when you look at this idea of blacks as second-class citizens, how do you think groups like this view blacks? They're neo-fascist, they're Holocaust-denying, they hate Jewish people. Uh, you know, they don't register on the... On the on the, on, the, on the radar screen. And so when I go back and I said earlier that this year marks the 400th anniversary of the Dutch bringing the first 20 blacks here as slaves, look where this has gone in 400 years. Have we, have we improved here? <laughs> That's open to discussion. And so when you see the racial disparities here, this has increased, you know, impressed blacks, they've been stuck in this bondage. The bondage has changed. Uh, the bondage has changed. And so, but do they have more rights today than they did? That case can be made. Certainly it can. 
But are they still considered second-class citizens? Yeah, go back to the 2008 mortgage crisis if you want, if you want to get into that. But here you see this, this idea of the gulag here. And I note here in this handout the notion of the South as defenders of states' rights and the Constitution is correct. That is from the perspective of white supremacy. For only light-skinned types were able to enjoy the precepts of nation building, that was the result of the revolution. And so to defend such liberal notions within, the, with a, with an economy that is based on forced labor, that's what this is, forced labor, smacks of the most impious of hypocrisies. But then again, such, was among, such were among the iniquities practiced by those feudal boyers in the South. And I use the term boyers because that was the landed gentry in czarist Russia with the serfs. And so, again, you see the development here of capitalism in America. If you recall what I mentioned uh, going back to the revolt of the planters, how capitalism evolves here. Yeah, you had agrarian capitalism in the South, but where is the North going? More in, in industrialization, finance, so on and so forth. And that's, and that's where the Industrial Revolution is really going to have its heart, in the North, in this country. And that doesn't mean that the North didn't benefit from Southern slavery. It did, because who's going to process a lot of the cotton and so forth? Up in the North. And who's going to export a lot of this? The North. So they have a bearing here, too. They have a bearing here, too. Interesting here, though, you know, following the revolution in 1790, they have to take a census. Now, this is interesting. Uh, is property usually subject to a census? It's an assessment. You do an assessment on property, right? Well, here they call it a census. Well, how can you have an, a census of blacks if they're not human beings in their property? Three-fifths, right, the three-fifths compromise in the Constitution, right. And so when you look at the, the federal census in 1790, 697,987 slaves, that's 1790. 1810, 1,191,353, and by 1860, 3,953,760. Now keep in mind, for the most part, after well, 1808, there was legislation passed forbidding the importation of blacks. However, here, they're doing what? Breeding them. They're breeding them. And if you, do you, how many here remember Jimmy the Greek Snyder? Uh, Leon's shaking his head. You remember that quip? Yeah, he made, yeah. When, you know, he was, you know, I used to, I used to like to watch Jimmy the Greek because I thought if you listen to him, he was, you know, out of Las Vegas. If you listen to him for five minutes, you didn't need to listen to people like Terry Bradshaw or those guys. He was usually right about the football games. I don't even think he touched a ball. Why? The betting odds in Vegas. And yet, in a, in a restaurant, he made the comment that, you know, uh, some, somebody was asking him about blacks having big thighs and being great, great athletes because of that. And Jimmy the Greek stated they were bred. They were bred for slavery. And what did CBS do to them? Canned them. Yeah, bye-bye, they canned them. You know, interestingly enough, I used to be a traffic manager in Norwalk for the Farrell Corporation, and I had some black guys working for me. And I asked them, I said, what do you think of that? You know what they said? He was only telling the truth. I don't know why CBS canned him for. Yeah, interesting. Their assessment. He was only telling the truth. And I specifically asked the black guys working there. And it's almost unanimous. It's only telling the truth, or that's what happened, or that kind of thing. And so that's, I find that interesting. Yes? Well, every once in a while, if you, uh, if you pay even a, a sometimes a little attention to what goes on in Japanese parliament, every once in a while you get one of these right-wing Japanese politicians that said, you know what the trouble with America is? They cater to blacks and Latinos. Yeah, well, they're very race insular there. You know, they, they frown on their Korean 
minority, so that tells you where they're going. And so here, but you know, as, as these numbers testify, you need, to re you need to breed more blacks or slaves, unpaid toilers. Why? Manifest destiny. You know, as we are expanding south and then southwest, you need more of these unpaid toilers. That's really what you need. However, at the same time here, you know, you go back to 1790 with Eli Whitney and his cotton gin. What happens with that? Now you can process more cotton quicker. Does that mean that you need more unpaid toilers to keep up with the, keep up with the workload? Yeah, you do. You do. And then in 1793, there's an improved cotton gin. Now this is interesting. Another boost was Eli Whitney's improved cotton gin in 1793. Now there's a difference in cotton. Long, if anyone's familiar with this, long staple, short staple cotton. Long staple cotton is grown in low, low country and could not be raised further inland as opposed to short staple cotton. The problem with short staple cotton is trying to get the seeds. That's a problem. The improved cotton gin solves that problem. So Whitney's improved gin is, solves the issue. And here it's interesting. In 1790, this shows you where this is going. 3,000 bales were produced in 1790. In 1793, 10, 000, 1795, 10,000 bales. No, 1793, 10,000 bales. 1795, 17,000 bales. Now the blacks have to keep up with this increased cotton as they are expanding and we add more states. And so by, by 1801, 100,000 bales were produced that year. And then by the early 1820s, they are producing 400,000 bales average a year. That's the early 1820s. That's only 30 years after 3,000 bales in one year. That's technology, that's the Industrial Revolution, that's capitalism. And we're adding states so you can grow more of these products further south and the southwest. Now keep in mind, less cotton is going to be grown in North Carolina because you really need 200 frostless days. So you want places like Georgia, Alabama perhaps, Arkansas, later on Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, finally Texas. The climate's better. The climate's better. Interesting how this is. Now, 75% of the cotton is exported. It's become the cash cow of American exports in the 19th century. And so does this provide a major boost of industrialization for the North? Yes. Because where is some of this cotton being processed? North. And I find that I find that concept interesting because by 1865, when the war between the states is over, whose agenda has won the war? The Hamiltonian agenda of the agrarian, or the, 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 or the industri industrialization of America, or the Jeffersonian idea of the agrarian? Well, I don't think it's hard to figure that one out. Industry won. It's an industrialized war. And so this idea of, of sending the cotton to factories for processing and then export and exportation helps the Hamiltonian notion as opposed to the Jeffersonian notion even to what you have today for farming. Aren't many of your farms corporate owned? Yeah, I mean even in the night, yeah, conglomerates, even in the 1900 Half of, Amer half of Americans were still living on farms. How many Americans now grow our food? Out of 330, so uh, 33 million, million people. Maybe two, three million? That's it. That's it. Four percent. That's still minuscule. That's minuscule. Not like it used to be. That shows you where the Industrial Revolution has gone. But, of course, here, as this idea of the gulag expands and you need more slaves, what, what, what happens to the price of slaves here? Yeah, 
Market demand here? Yeah. Interesting what I found here. The most expensive sort, a prime field hand, prime field hand, 18 to 25 years old, was worth $500 in 1832. Whence the price rose to $1,300 during the financial panic of 1837. And get this, and this is how this was quoted. Note the term. The same buck nigger was bought for $650 in eight, in eight, uh, in, at age 18, sold readily for 1,000 five years later. And the price of a slave on the eve of the Civil War, $1,800. Wow. And it's just, interestingly enough, you know, you, you have here, as they're exporting slaves, selling them, renting them, whatever the case may be, to, to, make, to staff those plantations that are opening, you know, this agrarian concentration camp system, you know, and they're taking slaves, they're taking kids from their families to do this in some respects. And that, that's with Harriet Tubman's family. She lost three of her brothers and sisters to this. And then when the slaveholder wanted to sell her off, that's when she bolted. And so she wasn't going to be part of this. I'm getting out of this. And she did. She did. But what do you think happens sometimes there, there, you know, as, as more slaves are being bred and with the expansion of this? Well, you, well, you ladies would know this. Uh, how, how, much, how much of a pressure does this put on women? Infant death syndrome here? Yeah. Is that pressure? I mean, you women have enough pressure having the baby. And now you have to have this? Uh, it's not very good. I remember when my, my wife had our first, well, you know, I'm sure you, you women, well, you, I don't tell you women this, you know, the, the first one is usually the longest. And I remember my wife called me up and she, you know, we had gone through those classes. She calls me up at work. She says the contractions are every 10 minutes. I said, call me when they're six. <laughs> the heck are you, a doctor? So she did. She called me when they were seven or eight. I said, all right, I'm coming home. And I took her up to the hospital. You know, we waited hours before Michael came. Not so with our third, Eric. Boy, he came out like cement down a Divine Brothers cement truck. I took my wife to the hospital. He was, he was born in two hours. Whew. Wow. Then, then, then there's the, yes, yes. Well, yeah, that's, well, you know, the, some of the real, real, if you want to use the term professional plantation owners, used to log all their slaves. They had ledgers. They logged their slaves. And they knew who they had and who they didn't had, who they didn't have, whether they sold them, leased them, loaned them, whatever the case may be, or those who ran away. They knew. Some of these plantation owners knew because they had them logged, you know, organized plantation owners. Now you're getting into a corporatized version of this. But, oh yeah, they did, sure. They leased them, loaned them, sure, rented them out, sure, sure. I mean, uh, Harriet Tubman was one who, whose, whose owner, loaned her to another slaveholder to do field work, and then she'd come back to her original owner. That, they, yeah, that went on. That went on. It's like, you're tra it's like baseball players. You're trading them around, if you want to use that terminology. How about the economics of the plantation system? You know, interestingly enough here, in 18, what was it, 18, mid eight, the early 1830s, there were, there were, 1830, there were 36% of Southerners were slaveholders. By 1860, only 26%. The group was retrenching. And then when you compare the average white farmer, who well, maybe didn't have any slaves, I'm talking about the small white farmer who was growing the feed, you know, maintaining the livestock. I mean, how did he make his money? He made his money by selling this his livestock, his feed, his pigs, so on and so forth, to the plantations. They weren't exporting this stuff to the North or Europe. And so, interestingly enough, the average white farmer by 1860 
was worth $1,781. The average plantation owner was worth over $24,000. I don't know, but that's a good question. But the fact of the matter is, what it does equate to there is political primacy. Who do you think controlled over 93% of the agricultural land? The southern aristocracy. And two, that also leads to <laughs> who's sending who to the so-called uh, congresses or leg state legislatures in the south. Who is controlling the governor's houses? Yeah, this gives you political primacy and also economic primacy. Interesting how this system works. For instance, Alabama, in 18, 66.4% of state legislators owned slaves in 1850. By 1860, 76.3%. And in that same year, the majority of state legislators throughout the South were slaveholders, as were the majority of the governors. However, there is a disparity here between the average, the average white in the South as opposed to the average white in the North. I'm talking about per capita income. And again, this shows you the difference, the disparity between the industrializing of the North and the agrarian South. In 1860, the average white had a had a had a had a gross uh, gross had a gross income here per capita of $103 a year. The North, $141. Where would you rather live? Unless you're in the one of the privileged class. That's part of the economic disparity here. Interesting. And then the industrialization. You had industrialization in the South. Many of them were grist mills, some saw mills, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, tobacco, pro sugar processing plants. However, in the North, you had some of those plants up North, but the North also had much in the way of heavy industry machine tools for the time, so on and so forth. They're much more sophisticated industrially. And they're much more sophisticated financially. That's where the banking interests are. New York City, Philadelphia, that's where the banking interests are. I mean, you had bankers down south. But the real power was up north. And interestingly enough, between eight, but then again, that flood going west to spread slavery. Between 1810 and 1860, 100,000 slaves are forcefully deported toward the new lands. 100,000, not counting those that you know, are bred on those new plantations. 100,000. Part of this is not only selling them, renting them, whatever the case may be, but again, taking youngsters from the slave families and exporting them to staff these new plantations. That's what, human trafficking? Uh, that, that, that would be frowned upon, well, at least it would be anyway, today. Beg your pardon? Yeah, by most, right. Although, keep in mind, since Gaddafi's gone in Libya, the slave trade has reignited here. The slave trade has reignited. Although, interesting, I found something else here. Another way the interstate slave trade operated was by owners who disposed of their slaves <laughs> to service wills or debts. The greatest sale on record occurred from a single owner in 1860. Now, note, note the name of the slave owner, and this is, this is, no, this is no joke. The slave owner's name was James Bond. <laughs> the largest plantation owner in Georgia. He sold 566 slaves 
at $580,000. It's a lot of money then. Another Georgia owner, Pierce Butler, sold 400 slaves to service his debts. Hmm. But then again, when you, when you look, when you look at the South in 1860, there are six million, approximately six million people here. People. We'll use that term people. Yet three million, over three million, nine hundred and fifty-three thousand are slaves or living and breathing property. That means just over five million people or whites live in the South as the war starts versus 22 million up in the North. Wow. Interesting here. And so since whites outnumbered the blacks, many of the plantations were of modest size. Interesting again, some of this research I uncovered here. In 1860, very few gulag masters had more than 50 slaves. Even less had 200 or more. By contrast, Jamaica, on the eve of the emancipation, one-third of slaves in Jamaica lived on holdings of 200 or more. Three-quarters lived on holdings of at least 50 or more. Now, here's another interesting, another interesting statistic. The holdings of serfs in Russia, just as a comparison here, even more concentrated, four-fifths of all serfs in Tsarist Russia in 1860 lived on plots that uh, were, the, were, the, were the landed gentry owned 200 serfs or more. That's concentration of land in too few hands. That really is. And so, and so here you see, now, how about, how about the plantations themselves? The plantation owner. Sometimes the owner, if he's a politician, uh, if you have more than one plantation, you know, you're beginning to, in, you know, you're beginning to franchise here. And it's a crude form of corporation. You bring in an overseer, right? Maybe the overseer is your son, your brother, whatever the case may be, or you hire somebody from the outside. And they impress upon these overseers, uh, you have to keep these people in line. Keep them in line. Now, keep in mind, this job of being an overseer, the hours are almost as long as the toilers. Which means some of these overseers didn't get out much. Maybe, you know, they, they didn't see their wife that often or their girlfriend or they didn't go out for a night on the town to have a few drinks, whatever the case may be, because they were the overseer. How do you think their humor was? Yeah, not good. And on top of that, on top of that, Again, getting back to what I mentioned earlier, yeah, some of these slave owners, you know, to keep track of this, you know, what their overseer was doing. And some of the overseers were not just the overseers for the unpaid toilers, they were also the administrators. Well, that can lead to skimming off the top here. But at the same time, some of these plantation owners, as a check, on the overseer that they had working for them might have a trusted slave informing on the overseer. Now, there's no honor among thieves here, folks. There truly is no honor among thieves. There really isn't. <laughs> wow. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like in a way the concentration camp system and the Nazis, they had some of those inmates uh, you know the camp guard, or or or, or maybe the 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 one of the guard, the chief of the guards would have uh, one of the inmates watching the other inmates, that kind of thing, for maybe special privileges like maybe extra bread, cigarettes, whatever the case may be. And so you see uh, one of the inmates selling the rest of his barracks mates down the down the river here. And so, interesting what you see develop here. 
among again this is just this is just what happens with people here now keep in mind some of these some of these you know the, the, the different tasks for the for the slaves themselves picking the cotton the sugar tobacco okay that's fine but keep in mind it was generally a lot of the men who did this but don't but don't 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 misunderstand this women did this too and there were various jobs to be done for example, the plow teams. You think they used horses? They used human beings for the plows. Yeah, some of them used horses or mules, whatever the case may be, but humans were used too. Humans were used too. Many of them were men. Again, we're getting to that age like 15 to 35 to 40. How long do you think somebody's gonna last here if they're on a plow team? How long do you think they're gonna last? And then, the, then there were the other jobs, too, like cleaning up the trash, cleaning up the brush. And there were other jobs that they did as well. Perhaps some slaves became cooks. Some became grooms. Some became servants. You're still a slave, however we cut this. Or, or those considered, I mean, this, again, sounds like something the Nazis are later going to do with the concentration camp system. Of course, they're a bit more... They're a bit more brutal. You know, if you couldn't do the labor, where'd they send you? Yeah, the gas chamber, right. Remember Dr. Mengele, those on the left will go to work, those on the right, right to the showers. But here you see a, a, a somewhat of a form of this. If you can't be on the plow teams, you were still having, you still, you still manned a hoe. It's maybe easier work. And again, that include women. Some of the servants, were either people who had gone through the mill of being a plow horse, and maybe now you can't do it anymore, so maybe now you become a groom, you become, you work as a servant. But then again, also, youngsters were also servants too. Until, uh, boys especially, until they became of age, out into the fields. Yes. Yeah, but the other side of the coin here is they're considered property. Go back to what I mentioned earlier. You know, if you paid $1,300 for a prime field hand, do you think you want your overseer taking undue liberties to keep them in line? You might not like that. Yet again, go back to what I mentioned earlier. If you've got somebody you paid $1,300 or even $1,800 for, and this is a prime field hand, if you think you can mold this person to be allied to the slave owner, Maybe he's the one you want to use to inform on the, on the overseer. But then again, did the overseer resort to the lash? Yeah, of course he did. They used stocks. They used, uh, they even used, they even used, they even to, to, to problem slaves, men, dressed them in women's clothes. Isn't that what Joe Arpaio used to do, that same sort of thing to immigrants who were a problem? Remember, he just used to dress them in pink underwear? Oh, yeah. I had to break them. Break them. It's the same sort of thing. And then again, then again, uh, slaves who were a real problem, they even resorted to mutilation or castration. But then again, if you resort, if you resort to castration, how are you supposed to perpetuate future slaves? But then again, when you got a lot, you know, it's a numbers game here. And then if a slave escaped, they had, I call them roving goon squads. Uh, patty rollers, they gave, they gave them the name. And these were guys who were paid to retrieve escaped slaves. And they were feared by the slaves. So you can imagine what type of men they were using to retrieve an escaped slave. I mean, they're, they're, they're groups of bounty hunters, if you want to use that terminology, to, keep, to, re, to get these people and return them to the owner. It's not a very nice system here for blacks who are tied up in this. Yet interestingly enough, and I find this fascinating, that with all this going on, with all this going on, 
many blacks begin to you know, acclimate themselves here to their surroundings, their situation. They're not getting back to Africa. That, that's over with. But then again, I'm sure there are, some, there are some people here of the Jewish persuasion that can talk about how some of their family members survived the Nazi system. You acclimate yourself to the current situation at hand. Well, look at some of these blacks opting to adopt the white man's religion, mainly Protestant, like becoming Baptists, or, and acclimating themselves with regards to music. How about the blues? Yeah, they did. And so when you look at this this way, you know, and then how is the music handed down? Keith Richards, anybody? Yeah, rock, right, exactly. Yep, spiritual, yeah, spiritual music, sure, sure. They're acclimating themselves to this horrendous situation. And while they're kept in bondage, and in some cases, you know, really abused here, I mean, it, it, even if you try to escape, and some did, some succeeded in escaping north, even going to Canada. In fact, there's the story of the cra the, the uh, the Kraft, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kraft, who wrote a book on this, and they escaped the South, and they went up north, and according to the fugitive slave law, they were in danger of being returned, and they were able to hop a boat, go to England, and they never came back. And they wrote a book on this. Uh, it's not a long book, uh, on their experiences of escape. So they left the country because they didn't want to be returned to the South. You can understand that point. You can understand that point. Fascinating here. And so interestingly enough, and I'm going to get into this more the next week, um, I have a quote here. And that quote comes from a book called the, the, the book called Racism by George M. Fredrickson. It's an interesting book. Popular among the less sophisticated religious defenders of slavery, keep in mind, religious defenders of slavery, was the reassertion of, and I'm going to get, again, get more into this the last week, this, this premise on slavery, was the reassertion of the hoary myth that God had placed a curse on the allegedly black descendants of Ham. That slavery had existed in biblical, get this, that slavery had existed in biblical times, but was never condemned by Christ. Therefore, could never be regarded as sinful. Talk about cherry picking your religion here. How about the sleeping quarters for these slaves? Some slept in barns. Some slept in lofts, huts. Some even slept outdoors. Although some slave, slave owners did provide ramshackle cabins for slave families. I mean, especially if you're going to, if you're going to use their children to be you know, slaves, unpaid toilers, maybe you do want to put them in some kind of shelter here. And their dress, very rough hewn, men in shirts and pants, women in dresses, youngsters in long like bed shirts, many of them. But I mean, they're not getting their clothes, folks, from Bloomingdale's. Some no shoes, right? Some no shoes. Interesting here. But again here, again here, uh, this whole, and another aspect here for women. Slave women, and I thought this was one of the most sordid aspects of this. You're, somebody brought up Sally Hemings before, was being used as for sex. Some of the slave women. And I've kind of likened this to what the Japanese did to the Korean women in World War II, yeah. Calling them comfort women servicing Japanese soldiers. 
you almost get the impression that they volunteered for this. I don't think so. I don't think so. You saw the same thing here. But then again, how about the products of such unions here? Do you think they're going to be in on the will of a, of a slave owner? I don't know if that's happening. And so this process from beginning to end with regards to the slaves themselves, it's bondage pure and simple. And while the slave here might not have undergone quite the privations of slaves in places like Jamaica, Haiti, Brazil, places like this, and a lot, some, of that is, some of that is the climate. It's a lot more draconian than the climate was here. You are still limiting somebody's freedom and you're not, re uh, you know, you're not regarding them as living and breathing people. They're living and breathing property, but they're still property. And keep in mind too, when the war first starts, is slavery one of the top rated objectives of the Lincoln presidency? No. The idea here was, in fact, uh, the la as I, again, the last week will be an analysis of this, and I have a couple of quotes, which is going to be in that handout, by Lincoln. This, is, this war isn't fought to, a, to the liberate the slaves. It's fought to put the country back together. Now, does that mean that this institution could survive? to bring the South back into the fold? Wasn't that part of the argument here on how the country was put together with the founders? Yeah, it was. It was. We'll solve the problem of slavery, and they're going to kick that can down the road. Yeah, it's going to be solved after 1861, all right, but it won't be solved in the halls of Congress. It will be solved again. That's one of those attributes of this war that's going to be the South is going to lose on the battlefield. And so this idea of bondage, keep in mind, it bolsters the American economy here. You know, you're using, you're using unpaid toilers, uh, uh, bondsmen, whatever you want to call them, to grow that, that American economy, that monolith which by 1900 is going to be the world's lead, Mer making America the world's leading industrial power. And part of that was on the backs of unpaid blacks, known as slaves. And so what you saw in the South was really, for all intents and purposes, for blacks, an agrarian concentration camp system. Place might not be Irkutsk, but it's still a gulag for these people. Anybody have any questions or any comments? Yes. Quite prevalent. You know, I mean, I was just listening to a case today. I think it's called the the the, the Grove, the Grove, it's down in Florida, the Grove Field, fo Grove, Grove 4, the Grove Field 4, I think it's called. And a fellow just wrote a book on this. And it's after the war, Second World War. And these four guys were blamed, four black guys were blamed for raping a 17-year-old white woman who was having marital problems with her husband at the time. Her husband used to beat her. And come to find out that there's doubts now whether they even touched her. And yeah, uh, beg your pardon? Groveland, Florida, that's it. Right. And because uh, I was listening to the author this morning, I didn't catch the whole interview, but I just caught part of it. And he said these, uh, uh, at least a couple of them were defended by a young black lawyer by the name of Thurgood Marshall. And one of them was caught in the swamps by a thousand white men and filled full of holes. And the same sheriff that led that posse killed another one himself. 
and then shot a sec a shot a third one, and when that 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 person that fellow wasn't dead, his deputy put another bullet into him, and shot him in the neck. This guy survives, and he winds up in prison, and his sister is one who is also telling this story, and uh, so this idea of blacks being less than human, it's still with us. It's still with us. In fact, I remember when um, going down south, my, my father knew a fella who was in the Air Force. He retired as a full colonel, but at the time he was a captain. The guy was an accountant. He would go to a ba Air Force base every two or three years to do the books. Then they transferred him to another, air, to another air base. And I remember he had two sons. One of them went into West Point after this. And we were, down, we were down at Macon Air, down at the Walter Warner Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. Uh, you know, I was introduced to some of these Southern kids when we were playing football. And I remember some of these Southern kids. You know, they were like, what, 12, 13 years old? Well, all we need is some niggers to play this game with us. Yeah. So this idea is, is prevalent and lasts for years. And so they were not considered, again, Go back to your own constitution. Three-fifths? Three-fifths of a person? Not five-fifths of a person? Three-fifths of a person. So the South can get adequate, you know, adequate representation in Congress. Well, of course they don't because they're not educated. And so this idea of, you know, of, and I'll get into this in the last, the last, the last talk, where they're liberated... Where are some of them going to go? Now it's good. Well, yeah. If, well, you know, in fact, our, our movies really do not bear this out. A lot of black men left the South and went West to become cowboys. A lot of our movies do not bear this out. Some join the cavalry. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, cavalry, cattle drives. In fact... Why was John, why was General Pershing called Blackjack? Because he commanded a black cavalry re regiment earlier in his career. In fact, he tried to explain that to George's Clemenceau, the president of France. And uh, <laughs> Clemenceau, what, what, is, what does Blackjack mean? And Pershing's trying to explain this to the president of France, and I, I think it kind of got lost on on, uh, on Clemenceau. So interesting, though, Clemenceau, during the Civil War, was a French journalist reporter. He reported on, on what happened here with regards to slavery. And when it came to Versailles and the discussions, and people are telling him, well, Wilson is for people to be able to determine their own fate, the equality of people. And you know what Clemenceau would tell him? I saw the South. Interesting. Yes. Correct. Correct. The South is beginning to urbanize. It's beginning to industrialize even now. And part of that goes back to the war. The war forces this because the South has to build, and they're going to start, a military-industrial complex. They have to organize. And so this idea of states' rights, that's dead in 1862. They have to have a strong central government, which is something Southerners were trying to get away from. And so they have, to, they have to do this to organize their economy for an industrialized war they're unequipped to wage. The farms moving to the city, urbanization. And, and, so, and some of the plantation owners, they don't want them to grow cotton, rice, and tobacco anymore. Gee, how about some corn? How about some wheat? You got to feed the army. And so when that doesn't work too well, what, is the, what does the Richmond government do? They send out the confiscation squads, and they're going to take a certain amount of the grain, the pigs, the horses for the war effort. You think that made these farmers happy? Not on your life. And so is this going to automatically change the fabric of the South? Yes. In fact, in fact, um, I'm sure some of you remember, you know, as this industrialization proceeds, even after the war, some of you remember the hat factories and clothing factories up here. Where did they go? 
Why? Cheaper labor, right, right. No union. Here he goes, no unions. However, what has happened to that since? Where did a lot of those jobs go? Overseas. Yep, overseas. And so, interesting here how this war helps to set an agenda following the war, helping really to kill, you know, answer your question, the plantation system. You know, and the, and the British figured this out years before. They, they outlawed slavery, so what'd they go with? Industrial revolution, capitalism, technology, the wage earner. Does that lead to other problems, though, economically? Yeah, it sure does, when you're gonna have socialists trying to bring together the worker and the producer to improve the lot of the worker. Now, that's another issue. Yes? Well, this, in a way, no, it, 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 you know, in a way, you're kind of a, a, um, alluding to what Georg Hegel said about dialectic materialism. Uh, first, there's a cause and effect which leads you to a result. Or, or as he would say, uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And so the thesis here might be slavery in the plantation. The antithesis is the war, which in the end liberates the slave, but then the synthesis is the result. Well, now what do you do? So does that create new problems? Yeah, it has. And so when the North pulls their troops out of the South, uh, what happens after that? Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, Jim Crow, and I'll get into that again last last, the last talk. But it's interesting how this changes the situation. The war helped to change it. But then again, if, if, if you, let's take the war out of the equation, just think out of the box for a moment, with the Industrial Revolution, technology and capitalism, was slavery gonna die eventually here? Probably. Would that have helped the black? We don't know because there was a war. And keep in mind what Frederick Douglass stated, uh, blacks joining the Union Army, and over 180, somewhere upwards of 180,000 will put on a blue uniform. You know, Frederick Douglass is telling them, don't be given freedom, go fight for it. Because if it's given to you, how valuable is it? But the whole system here from beginning to end was to use the human engine unpaid to grow cotton, to grow those agrarian products that would, that was the engine of the growth of the southern economy. And so you keep people in bondage to do this. And obviously here, this helps the northern economy too. So when you go back to what I mentioned last week about the Missouri Compromise, you know, some northern politicians and northern business interest interested in maintaining that at least in the Senate, you know, the, the same number of states or trying to get primacy here because of the control of the Senate. Uh, and then, you know, depending on how many of these territories become states, now that leads you to representatives from free states, representatives from slave states. And so the northern idea is to try to have primacy because of the fact northern business interests don't want to compete with unpaid toilers. So some of them have a vested interest in limiting the spread of slavery. While at the same time, Southerners are thinking, well, if the Northerners want to limit the spread of slavery, how long is it going to be if they tar start trying to dictate slavery in Virginia, in South Carolina, in Louisiana, so on and so forth? It's only a matter of time. And so that's the engine of our economy. Okay, then we're out of here. Secession, they leave, they leave. But then again, when you look at Lincoln in the beginning, I had no intention of, <laughs> it really wasn't gonna get rid of slavery because he wants those states back in the fold. And yet, what is, what is it supposedly, uh, uh, William Seward is supposed to have said, at last we are rid of those mosquito republics. That's not what Lincoln wants to hear. 
Beg your pardon? Y yeah, hookworm haven, yeah. Wow. Anyway, anybody else have any comments or, or yes, sir? Well, you know, slavery in the North was a different story. I mean, you, you might have some people that might have one, two, maybe three, maybe. Well, yeah, but up, but up in, but up in, like in Rhode Island and New York, uh, there were some farmers who had slaves. Uh, there, there were people who had slaves in their homes to maintain their homes. But at least, you know, they're still in bondage. There's no excuse for that. But the fact of the matter is, if you're living in someone's house and you're a slave, you're in a sight better condition than someone down in Louisiana. No, but then after a while, what do we need these slaves for? So they get rid of the institution. And a lot of that happens after the American Revolution. I mean, you can see where the North is going here. Industrialization, financialization, and that's Alexander Hamilton. That's his agenda, as opposed to the Jeffersonian ideal of the agrarian is the salt of the earth. But then again, there is that dark side to the agrarian agenda, and that's slavery. But then again, that's their economy. And they're going to try to keep that economy going. And that's what, exactly what they're going to do. And is that going to lead to a difference of opinion by 1860? Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Interesting, too, what I found here. Um, this, this comes from, this actually comes from that book I alluded to earlier, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William and Ellen Craft. And they had, a little, they had a little poem here. The United States, your banner wears, meaning the American flag, two emblems, one of fame, alas, the other that it bears, reminds us of your shame. The white man's liberty in types stands emblazoned in your stars, but what's the meaning of your stripes? They mean your Negro scars. Wow. That's pretty powerful stuff. That's pretty powerful stuff. Again, that's kind of reminiscent to what Mark Twain is going to say years later uh, when the United States grabbed the Philippines from the Spanish. You know, and the Filipinos are really training, one, trading one overseer for another. And that anti-guerrilla campaign, which was pretty brutal, kind of a forerunner of what you're going to see in Vietnam. And <laughs> Mark Twain, I think it was 1902, 1901-1902, stated that the American flag, that the white stripes on the flag should be dyed black, and that the stars should be taken off the blue field and replaced with skull and crossbones. That's Mark Twain. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Power of the pen. Yes. Right. And interesting, you know, and I'll get into this next week, the Harriet Tubman, uh, they op the, her family had a spread in uh, upstate, or upstate New York. And yet, um, th where they were, uh, they ignored the fugitive slave law up there. And but of course, some of her people that she rescued uh, they were not going to stay in New York. They wound up going to Canada, across the border. And so there was that going on. And interesting, what, interesting her, her story is fascinating. Uh, she's not just rescuing, sla not just rescuing slaves uh, from the South. Uh, she later gets into some guerrilla efforts with the Union Army. And then after the war, she gets into the suffragette movement. She becomes friends with Susan B. Anthony and so on and so forth. Uh, she's, she has an amazing story. She really does. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that happened. You know, people who were, yeah, supposed to be free. Right. Right. Wound up being, wound up being slaved again. Yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't, get, couldn't get rid of that brand. Uh, it's a tough time for blacks in this country at that point. Really tough. Right, and so uh, interesting too is, you know, once, when, you, when you look at this plantation system and all it entails, the plantation owner runs his fiefdom. And 
some of the locale. And so it's more rural than it is urban. And so once you, so once you get to the north, uh, as, as cities begin to grow and as industrialization proceeds, you're getting more and more people living in cities. Some like what was going on in Europe. Of course, Europe had a head start. But, and so are more people moving into the cities to work in factories or, lar or towns moving in a fact to work in factories? Yeah. And so does that breed a, diff a, a somewhat different society? Well, Jefferson stated that the, the farmer, the agrarian, and we can throw the plantation uh, owner in on this, uh, the, the agrarian here is the one who's really representative as that practitioner and protector of Republican government, as stated in your Constitution here, or as the founders were putting together. Why? Because he works the land. You know, land is big. Land is one of the reasons you have a country anyway. And so because he regards the land, Jefferson writes that people who live in cities have less of a regard for Republican government, have less of a regard for representative government. So the real saving grace here for Republican government in this country is the agrarian. That was Jefferson. Hamilton didn't hold to that. Hamilton didn't hold to that. Yet in between Hamilton and, and, and Jefferson is John Adams. Now, John Adams is not a slaveholder, but he states, you know, if you want a functioning system of representative government, the wide ownership of land is required. It makes no difference if you're in the South or the North. The wide ownership of land is necessary. And then there's George Washington, who in, his who in his farewell address even stated that even though there's more like agrarian interest in the South and more industrialized interest in the North, he's saying this in 1796, that it doesn't make any difference. Each section of the country has different talents which put together makes the whole. In other words, what he's trying to tell you is he doesn't like factionalism. He doesn't like tribalism. And in that same address, he's going to say he was against political parties because he thought political parties breeds people who become more allied to the party than to the country they live in. Gee. Yeah, what a concept. You don't think that doesn't happen now? You know. And so, so when you look at somebody like a George Washington, who didn't him and Martha have slaves? Yet they're the ones that, you know, in their will, when, when, one, when both of us are gone, they, they wanted their slaves free. But the fact of the matter is, you have a, a man who's, uh, who's the first president who seems to understand. Now, he might not have been quite the political philosopher of a Jefferson or a Hamilton, but maybe he was more, and used the term, the grown-up in the room here. I mean, part of his presidency was the referee, Jefferson and Hamilton. That was part of his presidency. And yet, out of, this, out of this general comes the fact that, yes, we need to understand that various areas of the country have advantages. And all together, that will, that will fix the whole. That will make us whole. We all have something to bring to the table. There's a speech that's missing in Washington lately. George Washington's farewell address. And so he's overcoming the differences between the North and the South with that 1796 address. Was he right? Yeah. I don't agree with slavery, but with regards to each section of the country has different talents they can bring to the table? Yeah, okay. That's, that brings us to the whole. That brings us to the mass. Unity, cohesion, whatever you want to call it, a republic. Whatever you want to call it. I don't see that happening now, at least not to the extent necessary. But in the bottom here is this thing known as slavery. But then again, when, when, when you look at industrialization, don't you have eight-year-old kids without shoes working in, working in some of these factories? 10, 12 hours a day? Are they getting paid? Yeah, I guess. Is that something to be admired? Not really. Not really. 
So, I mean, there's, there's food for thought there, too. Right, say, start, you, you know, the, the idea of, of a childhood, not like it is in the modern era, doesn't ex really doesn't exist to the extent that does now back then. Well, yeah, I mean, well, with some of, these, some of these female slaves, they had their child, guess where they're going? Back to work? There's no family leave here. No family leave here. So, I mean, motherhood, childhood, is it well regarded? Not to the extent that it should be. Not nearly the extent that it should be. Is that part of this? Yeah, it sure is. I can look it up. Because the date, the date, the date is before 17, I think it's before 17, no, it's before 1790, because he writes this about, about states, about the state's rights in Virginia. So this is before 1790. But I can get the date, that's no problem. Yeah. I, can get, I can get the page, page 270, Thomas Jefferson's writing, because that page will give me the date when that was written. So, because in the bibliography, it just shows, I just used Thomas Jefferson's writing. That's the date of the book. That's obviously not the date of when that particular quote was written. But I have the page number there, so it's easy to find. So yeah, that's, 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 a, good, that's a good point. Beg your pardon? Eventually they were. Yeah, but not, not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. Yeah, they were, they were doing the work. They were doing the work for the master, the overseer. or the, the ad You know, I honestly don't know if he did. I honestly do. That's a good question. Did he live or any property? I honestly don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to look that one up. Yeah, he was, he was, the, he was, yeah, he was the guy um, when he was president who was really stingy. And when the British and the French were taking American ships on the run-up to the War of 1812, he was urged to build frigates, big Navy vessels to build a big United States Navy. Well, frigates cost $300,000. So he built gunboats, which cost 10 grand. Now, you're not going to take on the Royal Navy with gunboats. It's not going to happen. Ma'am, did you have your hand up before? Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, the, uh, uh, the, the post-war opportunists that go down there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's scallywags. That's going to be part of the, the, the last talk. But, they, well, yeah, you're going to have your opportunists going down there to take advantage of the Southerners. That's basically what you're seeing here. And they were not overly welcome here. You know, there are they're people looking for something for virtually nothing at the expense of the people here. But then again, you know, when, when you're looking at, at this war, the Civil War, and this is an industrialized war, that's what it becomes. And so when people are down in their luck after this economic savaging by Grant and Sherman, I mean, let's call it what it was, are you going to get the opportunists going down, flowing down there to get something for nothing at the expense of the people who live there? Yeah, you are. You are. And if, if you want a dramatic view of this in a movie, uh, what about that movie with John Wayne and Rock Hudson, The Undefeated? When Rock Hudson was a plantation owner and you had a carpetbagger coming down wanting to, buy his, wanting to buy the plantation and the land for like 50 cents an acre? Even then, that's an insult. And uh, the... the, the uh, Carpetbagger, I think, was Victor Jory. That's perfect for him. You remember him. And, and Rock Hudson winds up burning the plantation home in the barn as opposed to giving it to these crooks. And so that's, that's, that's a movie. But the fact of the matter is there is some realism here with these, as you call them, carpetbaggers going down there to try to get something for nothing. But I'm going to allude to some of this late in that, in that last talk, talking, you know, uh, post-slave, what goes on here down south, part of the society that emerges here.
Uh, but part of it is urbanization, industrialization. But then again, there's things like these scallywags. What happens to the blacks when this is over? The rise of Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan. And so does the North keep its promise? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I've always and I've always made this case that you're seeing here this idea of a southern aristocracy, the landed gentry. This whole notion in 18 by 1860, it should be it should be understood at this point, this idea is dying. It's dying. And so you have people in an era of the of the snowballing of the industrial revolution, technology, capitalism trying to maintain primacy in an era that's dying here. And so what you, and interesting too, they proclaim themselves as the defenders of states' rights and the real defenders of the American Constitution. I mean, if you read the Southern Constitution, there really isn't much in the way of alterations here between that and the original Constitution. States' rights, yet by 1862, the Richmond government is growing into a strong, centralized government. Why? Because now you're in a conventional war the South can't afford to wage. And the North, time is on their side. Once they get their economy, once they get their economy in gear, who do you think is going to win this? Now the South has to play catch up. They have to start building factories. They have to start building a military industrial complex. It's late in the game for this, but they try it. They try it. And so again, as I mentioned earlier, urbanization's beginning now. Some of these farmers are moving off the farm or people are giving up their plantations, moving to the cities, Richmond, Savannah, so on and so forth. Selma, Alabama grows because of this. All the, the foundries, the powder, the powder facility to make powder for the war effort. And so, so it's the war is transforming the South. You know, the Southerners are almost in the same boat the Germans were in in World War II, although the Germans had a better had a head start in the beginning of the war. But they're overmatched. They're overmatched by two countries, the United States and the Soviet Union. So it's the, like the same thing with the North over the South. But what, this, but what are the seeds being planted here, though, for a post-plantation? Yes. You know, and again, going back to that thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, uh, the, the, the process of dialectical materialism, which, which Hegel put forth, and then Marx is going to pick up on. You see that here, though. You know, a, con a, a conventional war changes everything. It changes the economy, it changes society, and it changes government. And so you see this idea of state governments controlling these states gives way to a strong central government with an industrial or an attempt to industrialize the economy. And this is going to be the end of that southern aristocracy. And I still maintain that what you saw in 1860 is a mirror of what's going to happen to these European monarchs in 1918, 1919. It's a cataclysmic collapse. But you saw the forerunner of this in 1865. It's interesting to see this. It really is. When you look at this in a horizontal progression and then tear it apart and look at it this way. So what you, and, and this, is, this is what some historians are beginning to understand about the American Civil War, the importance of it as an industrialized conflict. And since we really didn't talk about much about this before, we've missed something in this country. And it gives you an idea of what happens in an industrialized war. When strong central government emerges, what happens to people's rights? What happens to their control of their own economy? You know, you own a business. You make so many widgets, right? You know, I'm going to ship so many widgets out tomorrow. You know, I have so many customers. Not World War I when, when they built the War Industries Boards and Bernard Baruch chaired this. Oh, no, 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 no. 
I need so many widgets from you. You better have them such and such a date. The transportation system's going to pick it up, which is now run by the, which is now controlled by Washington. They'll take it to the docks, to the shipping companies, which is now overseen by the central government, to the war effort, to the war front. And so this is a stark change in America here. What happened to? What happened to individualism here? No, strong central government. Well, you saw the seeds for this planted, 1862, 63, 64, 65. In fact, even here, something your founders would have been livid about, the North has an army of 2,213,000 men. A regular army. You know what Congress is gonna do to this army? In two years, there's only 57,000 men left in this army because they still believe, like your founders, a strong regular army is a threat to the republic. Interesting here, when you step back and take a look at this whole thing, what's going on? You had your hand up. Yeah, the education system up north was superior. Um, they had a higher literacy rate. That's important. Well, yeah. Right. But, you know, I mean, down up in the north, uh, I mean, did you have disparities in income here? Yeah, of course you did. Uh, were, were, were children of well-to-do families more educated than children of less well-to-do families? Yeah, of course there was. What is it as pronounced maybe as down south? Perhaps not. And so, you know, uh, this has been brought out too when they, uh, there's a military study done, and I can't remember the name of the study. The northern soldier versus the southern soldier as far as education goes. And, I mean, the northern soldiers, most of these northern soldiers weren't, didn't have PhDs, but were perhaps they better educated than their southern counterparts? Yeah, although if you read some military experts on this country, they say the southern soldier is the best soldier this country ever produced. Um, the best cavalryman this country ever produced. And so, but were there enough of them? No. But then again, you know, you step back and you take a look uh, you know, a lot of people rail about Robert E. Lee. Was he a good general? Yeah. Uh, but to me, one of the greatest generals we've ever had is Ulysses S. Grant, even though he imbibed in vitamins G, I, and N a lot. Because Grant took a look, going back to what I mentioned earlier about industrialization, technology, he understood he had all those advantages of number of people, resources, industrialization, and money. So I can lose one or I can lose two or three more men than the Confederacy for each Confederate, but who's going to win in the end? I am. And then he has Sherman with him who really understands the economic reality of war. And interestingly enough, shows you how history repeats itself, these two guys are going to win this in 1864-65 because, you know, Grant is going to take on the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, and what's Sherman going to do? Go from one side of the Confederacy to the other on a 60-mile wide path of destruction, burning every cotton bale he can find, tearing up the railroad tracks, destroying the rolling stock, taking food, and if he can't take it, he burns the farms. This is to leave people with nothing, nothing. If they're starving, they can't fight. And interestingly enough, uh, a Professor Russell Weagley, and Weagley's right, stated, you know, 1864-65, this is economic war, this is modern economic warfare. That's what this is. And yet, he's going to say, and he's right, because he's an Air Force historian, an air, a military air historian, he states that what Grant and Sherman did in 1864-65 is what British Bomber Command 
and the United States Eighth Army Air Force are going to do to Nazi Germany from 1942 to 1945. Only instead, on horseback, they're doing it from 25,000 feet in Halifax's Lancaster's B-24s and B-17s. It's the same thing. Well, it worked in conjunction with the other arms, you're correct, because Arthur Harris said, well, we, I can win the war. That's what he stated. That's what he told them. I can win the war. By 1944, they built over 40,000 fighter planes, but they were running out of fuel. And so, but the fact of the matter is, the basic premise is correct. What Grant and Sherman do on horseback, uh, the United States and Britain are doing from 25,000 feet over Germany. It's economic war. It's just, the, it's the same sort of thing. It's the technology. It's changed. It's changed. And so, but the basic premise is the same. The idea is not, maybe it's not so much to fight the enemy army on the battlefield, but let's attack the infrastructure at home that keeps that enemy soldier on the battlefield. That's the idea. And this comes with what? The Industrial Revolution, capitalism, finance. That's where this comes from. You know, we're, we're not, you know, the days are long gone when you told Stosh, okay, drop the hoe, drop the hoe, pick up the pike and get in line. Now it's a different story. Now it's a different, it became a different story because of the Industrial Revolution. You know, and you can't, and you couldn't rely on just volunteers and professional soldiers anymore. War had gotten to the extent, because of the factories and the technology, if there's more weapons because there's more factories, what do you need more of to offset the losses? More bodies. And the casualty rate will go up as technology improved, well, look at this little phone, right? What, what can that little phone do now, as opposed to what it could do 15 years ago? Same thing with weaponry. As weaponry is, incre is increasingly becoming more sophisticated, and you're able to reap a greater harvest of humanity, you need more bodies to replace same. And that's, it's, one feeds on the other. So if you look at the Great French War, look at the Civil War, look at the First World War, look at World War II, what happened with that one? 55 million dead, 60 million dead? And man's greatest industrialized conflict? Wow. Uh, it, it's, it's astounding here. When you look at it in a horizontal progression, what you see. But again, your war between the states fits in this progression of industrialized war becoming more and more pronounced. And Mr. Sherman and Mr. Grant understood this. This is why this makes, I think, uh, General Grant one of the greatest generals this country produced because, not because of the strategy and tactics per se, because he understood history's changing here. And you better be astute for this between your drunken stupors. There are guys I know sober that can't figure this out. Yeah, he was. Well, yeah, a couple of times he was. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, Sherman, you know, Lincoln would get complaints. Lincoln would get complaints. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He thought his career was over. Yeah, he thought his career was over. Yeah, you know, I mean, there was one point where, where you know, someone told, I think, I think the story goes, told Lincoln he was, he was uh, you know, he had had a few, he was drunk or whatever. And Lincoln said, well, find out what he's drinking and send him more of it because of the fact that we were, we're winning here. You know, uh, but then again, Lincoln would get complaints from some congressmen or senators. Uh, he takes too many losses. You know, the, then Lincoln would say, but he wins. Because I always thought if, if you took, you know, people are a product of their era. You know, like I just said, I think Grant is one of our most, one of the most competent generals this country ever produced because he recognized his time. George Marshall is another one of those. Whoop, you all right? 
George Marshall is another one of those. George Marshall, believe it or not, to get us ready for World War II, actually stepped back and consulted GM, Ford, GE, and IBM and restructured the command staff to look like a business. He understood industrialized war. <laughs> and was he a really great field commander? That's irrelevant. The total picture here. Well, let Patton and those guys handle that. But interesting here when you look at it from this perspective. But then again, when you look at Grant, he takes too many losses. But he wins. I don't think Grant would have been as popular in World War II. Would he have been as competent? Maybe. But I don't think the American public would have held him in as high regard as maybe some do now because he's willing to take losses. But having said that, would he have been good on the Russian front with Zhukov? Oh, hey, he'd have fit right in. Take losses and drink a lot of vodka. What a party this is. But we're going to beat the Germans no matter what. So I think he would have I think he would have been went over well in the Soviet Union in World War II. But I don't think he would have been quite as well regarded. But again, you're a product of your time. You know, what you accomplished in your time, you might not be as popular either before or after. He was a product of his time. Interesting character, uh, Grant. Yes. Yeah, but, I mean, you had somebody like a John C. Calhoun, who was an ardent Southerner, but he wanted the country whole as opposed to these later firebrands like Edward Lounge Yancey, um, Robert Barnwell Rhett, people like this who were really, I mean really, firebrands. Well, he, no, he, was, he, was, he was generally one for uh, the, the, the Union, but he was, a, he was a Southerner. He wanted to keep, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't really opposed to slavery here but he wanted to keep the country whole. I mean, keep in mind, he, he was a Secretary of Defense at one point. And there was talk about him being a president, John C. Calhoun. But, you know, after him and Clay are gone, well then, their ideas get taken over by people who are a bit more radical, and we're out of here. Yeah, I mean, Robert, Robert, Robert Barnwell Rett, who was who was an editor, I think it's the Charleston Mercury, a newspaper, vehement anti-North, ardent pro-Southerner, uh, rabid, I mean rabid here, uh, uh, you know, inducing, the, inducing Southerners eventually to secede. That's the only way you're going to solve this problem is to secede. And guess what? That's what's going to happen. They're going to secede. But interestingly enough, when they secede, that's not how the first continental, how the Confederate Congress is. It's very conservative. And so, you know, you, like Jefferson Davis, people like this, well, they're going to put together a government and run it as if it is a government, and they're not going to be revolutionary to the extent like a Ho Chi Minh or somebody like this. It doesn't happen. And so these firebrands, what happens to them? They really don't have much of a say anymore. They got them there. Then after that, well, keep in mind, Jefferson Davis at one point was in the United States Army. He was also Secretary of Defense for a while. And so he's going to be more conservative in his views. I mean, you're not, put, you're not putting a Colonel Muammar Gaddafi in command of the Confederacy at this point. It's Jefferson Davis, who's used, who's used is more conventional, let's put it that way. And so, are you going to be very radical here? No, not going to happen. Oh, I think by, I think by 1862, when McClellan inv uh, invades the Virginia Peninsula to take Richmond, and once, uh, once Jefferson Davis proclaims martial law in the Confederate capital and evacuates and leaves it to a general, James, John, James Wind, John Winder, who, who will oversee the martial law, I think you're seeing at this point this idea of states' rights, it's dead. When martial law is proclaimed, what rights do you think you have? 
It's over. And so following this, you are, be seeing, you are beginning to see stronger and stronger centralized control of the government. Even to the point where Winder even proclaims you have to have a passport or something along those lines to leave your hotel and come back. They have to keep track of who's coming in and out of the city, don't they? Railroad, same thing. Food is going to be rationed. Even to the extent you have to report your guns to the Confederate, Confederate ordinance. Now, I don't know about you. You go down and you tell some chitlins and cornbread boy you're going to take his gun. And so when I, you know, when I hear some of my gun friends I used to shoot with, ah, they'll never take my guns. Really? Go back to March, April, 1862. Down, of all places, down south. You're in a war. They have to keep track of all of this. And if that means they're going to take your gun, then they're going to take your gun. A fantasy world here. Fantasy world. Oh, so, interesting. Have yourself a good one. Otherwise, folks, that's it. We're done. <laughs>